Sometimes I need to be reminded of this. Sometimes I need to be reminded that all of the people that Jesus invited to follow him were broken people. Sometimes I just need to look back at the story, and it's easy sometimes, so all you see is the good, all you see is the, the victory, the win. But it's good sometimes to look back at the stories of the New Testament and see that the people that Jesus called to follow him were people who were broken, they weren't believing, they were... Um, making mistakes, there, there, was, there, there was just this amazing group of unbelievers and sinners that gathered around him. And what's even more fascinating is you see that even at the end of his public ministry, they were still confused. And I think sometimes that's, that's good for me to hear because I think sometimes when I'm living out my faith, I, I, I don't have all the answers. I find myself confused. I love being able to look at the Bible and see that people were getting it and still understanding and still living out their faith. Even after the resurrection, they still had not quite gotten it, which is why we have much of the New Testament is um, we have letters that are written to churches like the one at Colossae that we're looking at um, that were written because people were trying to figure out how do we live our faith out because we're not perfect people. And that was really evident in the lives of those people. In fact, the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Colossians or the letter to the church at Colossae, he also wrote another letter and in that other letter, there's a point and it's in Romans chapter seven in which he says, I do the things that I don't wanna do and I don't do the things that I wanna do. In other words, um, I'm not who I want to be. I, there are times when I struggle with being the person that I believe I'm supposed to be, being the person that at times a relationship with Christ makes me think I, sh- I should be. Um, it's good sometimes to be reminded of, of, our, of our mistakes, be reminded of the reality that there's a tension that we live in where we don't get it right all the time. Um, this morning I was kind of grasping for an illustration of what it looked like to make a really big mistake, and then on the way here um, I got one. Because we're driving down the road and we were talking about our plans after church today and we were trying to sort out, you know, who's riding with who because we have multiple cars when we come on Sundays and we've got lunch plans and we're trying to figure it all out. And we were going down the road and driving and I, I just was kind of looking over my notes and Sherry was driving and I said, hey, where's Maddie? <clears throat> this morning we left one of our children at home. And it was just great, because here I was grasping, like, you know, I just need some illustration of how imperfect I am. And God's like, how about right now? How about this moment? You do things that you don't want to do. And so we pulled up, and fortunately, she was laughing, standing in the driveway, and uh, she hadn't reached the tear point yet. But I think it brings up a challenging issue for us. I think there's this issue of what does it look like to be a Christian and how do we become transformed people? And the reason that's an issue is that I think for us, and if if you're a part of Summit, you understand what I'm about to say. I think it's really clear to us, and this is something we're always talking about, it's very clear that Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. Religion being this system of do's and don'ts through which we behave a particular way in order to, to achieve God's favor. We, we, we resonate with that. There's a part of us that when we hear that it's not about what we do, but it's about what Christ's done, there's a part of us that gets really excited about that. There's a part of us that, that thinks, man, I love that about Jesus. I love that Jesus wasn't coming to set up another world religion, but that he was establishing relationship with God. There's, there's something that I think for most of us, that's a compelling message. It's exciting. It's, it's life-giving. It's encouraging. And, and most of us hear that, and we agree. We go, you know what? You're right. There's something different about Jesus. But then there's this issue. And the issue is that there are other things that we start to think about in regard to our faith. Like we start considering, why is it that I began believing in Jesus to begin with? Why was it that I initially made the decision to follow Christ? Certainly there were some existential reasons. There were philosophical reasons. Um, for, for those of us that, that chose to follow Christ, especially in adulthood, um, there, are, there are reasons that, that definitely uh, fall into the category of philosophy. This is what I believe to be ultimate reality about where I live. But when we get past that and you really start to consider and think about it, for many of us, in fact, for a lot of us, one of the primary reasons that we came to Christ to begin with was that there was something that we wanted to see changed. Like we looked at our life, and maybe we're not there right now. Maybe some of you are smack in the middle of that. I don't know where you are on the spectrum or the, the continuum of change and transformation. But, but when you get past the existential reasons for why we believe in Christ, for many of us, we come back to this place of saying, there's something that I don't like about myself. 
There are things that I do that I wish I didn't do, and I wish that, that things were different about me. There, you, you wake up one day to, to maybe get a, a, a glimpse of your heart, and you go, man, who am I? Or there's a sense of emptiness, or maybe there's a sadness, or maybe there was a, a tragedy, and you had no way of dealing with what was going on around you. The reality is that most of us come to a place where in our journey towards Christ, we realize that something needed to happen in us. Something needed to change. Something needed to be transformed. And so embedded in this relationship with Christ is this desire for transformation. I want to be a different person. That's why I came. And yet the primary way that human beings seek that transformation is through religious behavior. And Jesus says, that's not what I came to do. Which leaves us in a very awkward spot, doesn't it? Because we say, you know, you're right, this isn't about religion, and it's not about do's and don'ts. And it's not about me just behaving religiously. And then all of a sudden we realize, well, but I still want to be changed. How do I change? How do I be transformed? How do I, how do I live this life out if it isn't religious behaviors? What, is this, what does this really look like? That's what Paul is trying to clarify for this church at Colossae. Here's a group of people who were beginning to be drawn back. They were gravitating back towards the religious behaviors of the past. And Paul is pressing them back to say, listen, you, you don't have to be religious to be transformed. And so he's writing to help us understand, to help you guys understand, help me understand. Like, how do we do that? How do we live this, this transformational life out without falling back into religion? And so this week is very specific in that subject, and we're picking up where we left off last week, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, and these are the words that Paul says. He's talking about this transition that we're walking through. He says this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, this is really interesting when you think about this. Paul is bringing out life, right? He's bringing transformation. The reason he's writing this is so that you and I would have the life that Jesus promised when he said, I came that you would have life and life to the full. And it's fascinating to me that as a part of this message of life, there is so much talk of death. Not the what are you going to do when you die um, kind of death, but the kind of death of, of a person. Paul has this repeated theme, and even in this, he begins in verse 5 by saying, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, he's connecting to what he's just been talking about in the previous verses, the ones that we looked at last week. In the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, Paul reiterated something he's been saying over and over and again to this Colossian church, and it's this idea that we're dead. He's saying, listen, there was a life that you lived, there was a life that wasn't a life, but you were existing. And when Christ was crucified and buried, you died with Christ. That life that you lived died. It's gone. It's over. And when Christ resurrected, you were resurrected into a new life. That's this reoccurring theme. You aren't who you used to be. That person you were before Christ, no matter when you met him, is not the person that you are today as you sit here and read these words. You died with Christ. Now that brings up a really interesting tension if you look at this text because he says after this, now, if that's true, put to death. Put to death what is earthly in you. When I read this, I read a contradiction, don't you? If I'm dead, why is there parts of that life that, that are still alive? Why, why do I need to do this? If I'm dead, then what's left to be put to death? What is Paul saying here? He's saying, listen, you're dead, now put these things to death. That doesn't make sense to me. Whenever these, these moments come up for me in Scripture, I want to resolve them. There's something that needs to be resolved because I'm, I'm not settled with with just living with this contradiction. There's this tension that exists in this. He's saying, listen, you're dead, and yet something needs to be put to death. 
And what Paul is revealing by saying this is something really important. And if you want to remember something today, here's something you might want to remember. But he's revealing that there's a difference between what is spiritually true and what is experientially true. There's a difference between what's spiritually true about you and about me in Christ that can be different than what we experience in life. There's a spiritual reality and there's an experiential reality. And Paul is addressing the gap that exists in between. Now, in our culture, we want to call this a contradiction. We want to point fingers and say, well, I'm going to question the integrity of Christianity because if I believe these things about Christ, then these things ought to just automatically take place. That's kind of our instant gratification culture that leaks over into our philosophy. We think, well, Jesus doesn't have credibility if, uh, if I believe something and I'm supposed to be dead, and yet there's this dead person that's up and walking around. That's called a zombie, and I, you know, there's like this weird thing, right? Like this... Our culture wants to point fingers at this, and yet what's fascinating is that we, we're okay with this kind of scenario in other situations. Um, let me put it in, in these terms. Let's say that, um, that you go to school, and, and you get educated in a particular trade or in a, in a particular uh, way of living or whatever you, know, whatever you go to school for. You, get, you, you graduate, and then there's that moment after you graduate when you're sending out resumes to companies, and you've gone through all these years of... I mean, You've, you've sat through class after class, and you've done internships, and, you know, you've written papers, and you, you know, you graduated, right? There's that moment, when, and then you send the resumes out, and somebody reads your resume, and they believe what you wrote on your resume, <clears throat> talk about a faith step, and they hire you. They hire you for the job that you've been going to school for, and then you get this job title, and there's this position that goes with you. you know, maybe you get a business card and it says your name and then a comma and then it has whatever it is that you do after it. Has anybody ever walked through that experience? You applied for a job that you were trained for and you got it. Raise your hand if that happened to you. Yeah, a bunch of us, right? Do you remember your first day? <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember that moment of going, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? You know, it's like, like we think this when we see young doctors, right? Are you sure? <laughs> I, I recently saw a physician's assistant, and, and, uh, and, and I walked in the room, and I thought he was, like, my daughter's age. And there's, like, this moment of, are, are, you, are you sure, right? And I keep waiting for him to go, no, not really. <laughs> it's what they showed me in school. I don't... See, we're okay with this tension. We go, well, yeah, you have the job and you have the title, but you have some experience to gain as you become increasingly proficient. You can have the title and yet not be completely proficient. The same thing is true in athletics, right? You can try out for a team and you can make that team, but by making the team, it doesn't mean you're the star player and it doesn't even mean that you're going to have an opportunity to play with the other team, other teammates until you learn how to work with them, right? So while we might look at this and say there's a contradiction in other areas of life, we accept that you can be dead and yet have a life that doesn't look like your deadness. We can accept that you have a job and that you don't know exactly how to do that job yet. Paul says you're dead. That's a spiritual reality. You're no longer defined by or bound by the definitions of your old life. At your core, you are no longer that person, but you are are not done. You're not done. This is, this is the process of Christ's story, of resurrection becoming our story. We're making what we know to be spiritually true, true in reality. We're, we're, we're actualizing the spiritual realities of what we believe in. We believe these things, and then now we're beginning to live that out, and we're seeing it in actuality. That's what Paul is describing. And what he's saying to us, and this is, this is what we begin to understand, is that in the middle of this, we have a responsibility. The vocabulary of this says, you have something to do in this. You play a part in this. You don't just believe things and expect this transformation to take place. He's saying that I'm responsible for this. If I want something changed in my life, if I want to see this transformation, I have a part in making it happen. And he, he begins to give us very clear definitions. He says that this happens by putting to death what is earthly in us. And we begin to get a picture of this life that we're living and the tension that exists in it. 
when he, when he uses this, this phrase earthly, he's really talking very specifically about soil. He's talking about dirt. He's talking about terra firma. He's talking about this stuff that we stand on. And the picture that he's painting is that there is this part of us that connects, like our feet connect us to this earth. There are these places where our shoes and our feet come in contact with the soil, and where those things come in contact, we find ourselves um, being citizens. We are inhabitants of this earth where those things connect. We have the dirt of the earth between our toes, and we are a part of it. And what Paul is identifying is a separation between that soil and our identity and where we find our citizenship, our inhabitants. He's separating these things. He's pulling them apart. He's saying, what is earthly in you? What is it that keeps you firmly planted in this world? What is it that keeps you living your life the way you used to live your life? That's what he's referring to. He's saying those things that keep you, keep you planted in this soil, that's what connects you. That's what this is about. So take these things. Take these things and put them to death. The things that connect you to the brokenness of humanity the things that connect you to the, the things of your life that you wanted to change, the things that disintegrate your soul, the things that make you a less whole, more anxious person, he says, put those things to death. Eradicate them. Put an end to them. Don't go the way that you used to go. And then Paul jumps in the next verse, and he begins to list these things out. And I think it's very interesting he says in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, or lust, your Bible might say, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. I look at that list, and it's funny when I look at that list and I read it in here. And I read it in this room with all of us, and we're in church, Right? And he starts with sexual immorality, and I go, yeah, I agree. Impurity, yep. Passion, specifically, lust. He's saying lust. Put the lust to death. And I go, uh-huh, I agree with you. you that's, it looks ridiculous, doesn't it? Evil desires. Well, of, of course we put those things to death because they're called evil desires, right? And so, of course, we've got to do that. We're, you know, there's like a point of agreement. And then he goes, and, and then covetousness. And if you, in case for a second you thought, well, maybe it's okay to covet just a little, he goes, which is idolatry, right? So just about the time you're like, it's all right to covet a little. He goes, no, it's not, right? So you look at this stuff in here, and you go, okay, this, this makes sense. You read the list of vices, and you think about them being the silty dirt that our feet are setting in and resting in, and we say, okay. Because in this room, right now, in this moment, if anybody were to trot out what it looks like to live a transformed life, none of us would say that sexual immorality or impurity or lust or evil desires or idolatrous coveting is a part of a transformed, redeemed whole life. None of us would go, oh, that's, that actually, you know, I think Paul's wrong. We would all agree. we go, that doesn't look whole, does it? It's pretty obvious. So why mention it? Because it still sells doesn't it? Why does he mention this? Because this still sells really well. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, covetousness, it still sells, right? It sells advertising. It sells our loyalty to shows. It, I mean, and I'm not saying that, that by watching we're buying it, But isn't that what we see today? I mean, isn't this what we're constantly being shown in entertainment? Isn't this what, what we find ourselves being entertained with? This is kind of the thing we revolve around as Christians. We kind of live in this little tension of, of grayness where it's, oh, how much can I? How much can't I? What, what's good? What's bad? We find ourselves thinking these things. And, and isn't this the place that our culture, that our earth tries to connect humanity with meaning? Isn't this where we, you know, isn't this where our feet touch the ground in our culture? Is it, like, you, you, don't, you don't enjoy your life, like you find your life boring? Or you're mildly depressed? 
or you're bored sexually, or he doesn't do it for you anymore, or she doesn't do it for you anymore, I need a little bit of adventure. And those are things that are going to come up in our soul, right? Like, there's a reason that men experience a midlife crisis, right? There's something that happens. There's a reason there's stereotypes. There's a reason there's behaviors that repeat. We do this. And we start thinking, well, maybe if I got all my stuff organized and it all matched and it was all new and it was all clean and it was all put away with labels on it, I would feel better about my life, right? Or maybe if the sex was a little bit more exciting or maybe if his conversation with me was a little bit more engaging. And the, the reason that this stuff still sells is that when we begin to ask these questions, we believe frequently that this is where we find the answers. And on paper, it looks ridiculous. You walk into here and you go, there's no way this stuff works. But in reality, it's tempting. In reality, it's, it's where we begin to connect. When our soul begins to stir, we find ourselves running to these places as an immediate solution. Why does, why does Paul mention these things? He's not mentioning them because he wants to see behavior modification. He's mentioning these things because these are the very things that we begin to run to when we stop believing the gospel. The gospel tells us that we're loved unconditionally, unbelievably. When we, when we begin to forget that truth, that reality, what do we do? We start searching for love in all the wrong places, right? That's not in my notes, but it's a good song. When, when, we begin, when we begin to believe that we don't have enough, that we don't have value, when we believe that maybe there's not enough respect as men, what do we do? We want to garner that respect. And so what do we do? We go for possessions. We go for things. We go for relationships. We go for passionate adventures. Why do we do these things? Because we stop believing the gospel. We stop believing what the gospel says about you and me. We stop believing that we are these accepted, loved, whole people who have a life of joy and transformation ahead. When we stop believing those things, we run to these things, which is why Paul brings this up. He says, listen, I want to talk about this because this is not the alive kind of life. You're not experiencing new life if you're pursuing these things. You may be alive, but you're living like you're dead. So put these things to death. That's, those are the things that never lead to life. Put these things to death. You know, all of that brings verse 6 into perspective. Um, verse 6 says something that our culture today really struggles with. And, and people living in the world today, when it comes to ideas around theism and proving the existence of God or, or how we believe or what we believe, this is a major issue. But when you understand the context of the verses that we're looking at, then you also understand the, the, con, the context of this complicated idea around the wrath of God. Um, in verse 6, Paul continues on, and he says about all this stuff, the soil, the silt that's between our toes, he says that on, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now, before I unpack this, I want to say there's an interesting dynamic in those of us that speak English, um, raise your hand if you speak English. Okay, that's all of us, right? <clears throat> we do something really funny with the Greek when we translate it into English. You know, and, and the New Testament was written in Greek, which means that our English New Testament, somebody made decisions about what words best described what was being said in that culture. What's fascinating is that um, the word uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, actually, when it's translated wrath, it's the word that we use for anger with everybody else. Like if it's humans... It's anger, but if it's God, we translate it wrath. When in the culture that they were in, it was exactly the same word. It was angry. Um, I just think that tells you a little bit about our orientation and our world towards God. We tend to think we're, he, he's out, like God's, God's not angry. God has wrath, right? But it was the same word. God gets angry. God, God gets angry. But even still, I know plenty of people, and you know plenty of people, who when they hear about this or they read verses like that, they go, well, I can't believe. I, can't. I struggle with understanding how a God, a loving God could be wrathful, how a loving God could be angry. You ever hear these things? How do we deal with a God who's, who's filled with wrath? Like, how can a loving God behave that sort of way? And it's funny how much we struggle with that when it comes to God, 
but we have no problem with it when it comes to humanity. So if I, if I go home, my kids are old enough now that they hang out by themselves at the house. So if, if I come home and my kids have been hanging out at the house, and I open the door, and I find that they have been hurling insults at each other, and they've been clawing at each other because they're girls, and they've been fighting, and they've been hateful. How do you think I respond when I walk in the door and I see them just like, here are my daughters, and they're hating each other, and they're wounding each other, and there's brokenness and disruption? Oh, come on, guys. Just, just love each other. You want to see angry? Why am I angry? Because I love you better than this. I love you more than this. And this grieves me when I see this, right? I mean, if, if, there, were, if there were two children that began to get in a fight together, and mom and dad quick said, get the camera and the chairs, let's watch this one play out, and they pulled up a seat, every one of us would say there is something sick and wrong about a mom or a dad who's okay with watching their children wound one another. Amen? So why is it that we put a different expectation on a loving God who looks at his children and they wound each other? They turn sex into a commodity. They, they dehumanize one another sexually. Why is it that we struggle when we see verses and go, how could God be angry at that? We're just being true to ourselves. And God looks and says, you're wrecking yourself. You're wrecking each other. You're hurting one another. When he sees us wounding each other, it makes sense. That's the context for this. A loving God gets angry. A loving God sees people being egocentric and wounding one another, his family, his children. He goes, this grieves me. Love and wrath are the opposite sides of the same coin. You don't get wrath without love. They come together. And so Paul says, put this stuff to death, not because God's going to get you, but because this is the stuff that grieves the heart of the Father. This is the stuff that when he looks at you in your brokenness, he just, he's so upset because he sees what you're doing to yourself and to others around you. And it's not who you are anymore. That's the point of this. That's what verse 7 is all about. He says, in these things you once walked when you were living in them. When you see the word walk in the New Testament and specifically in the writings of Paul, when you see it used like this, it's a reference to the manner in which you live your life. This is how you live your life. Very much like the word seek that we looked at last week, where it was about the will of a man or the will of a woman, the direction, the purpose of your life, where you find meaning. When, when Paul says walk, he uses it in that reference. It has to do with where you find your identity and your purpose, your reason for being. And maybe just where you're trying to find meaning in your life. And I think this is one of the more beautiful aspects of this letter that he writes to this church. Because he uses the past tense. You once walked in these things. What he's saying is, this isn't true of you today. This isn't true of you today. You were living in them. You were living in them. These are the, these are, this was how you defined your life. And for some of you, I know maybe you came to Christ at a young age and you go, wow, I don't remember when I was like seven being remarkably lustful. But everything about your nature, everything about the course of your life, and for many of us, we know exactly what it was like to live in to define life, to find meaning in the things that Paul is unpacking here. He says, you no longer live that way. It's completely past tense. It's not who you are. In fact, what, he, what he's saying in a roundabout way is that you are not what you do. Who you are is not what you do. After the death and resurrection that you have 
participated in in Christ, you are no longer defined by what you do. You are not the sum of your parts, the sum of your behavior. There's a difference between walking in them and doing them. He's saying, listen, after this resurrection, there's something that's different. Before, when you did those things, that was because that's all you had. It was the way you walked. It was the way you lived. It was the only thing you had to hold on to. But after that, these are just simply things that you do. They are not who you are anymore. I spent a a good portion of my childhood in a swimming pool. I mentioned that a couple weeks back. And uh, I swam in high school, and and then I swam in college. And I was staring at the bottom of a swimming pool one day when I realized that I had made swimming a god to me. I made swimming my life. It was where I found meaning. It was where I found purpose. And some of you know I've shared this story, but I'll never forget in my dorm room, sitting on a university campus, just grieving, realizing that I did not know God because I had made a sport my God. In the weeks that followed that moment, I made the decision to walk away from something that I had done for years, 4.30 in the morning, five o'clock in the night, every single day in my life was spent in a pool. And I walked away. And then I found myself one day standing in a gym in Glendale, Arizona, 24-hour fitness, and they had a pool. And I decided that I was going to go swim one day. And I'll never forget, I'm swimming, and I notice while I'm swimming that people were watching me, because I'm fast, right? I'm faster than any of the middle-aged wannabe triathletes that are swimming around me, right? They're gasping for air, and I'm just rocketing past effortlessly. And I remember noticing, I remember, I mean, this is still a very, very clear memory. I remember seeing their faces, and and I remember finishing, and somebody came up to me, and they said, all right, who are you? And when they asked that question, there was a crisis in my soul because for all of my life up until that point, when somebody asked me who I was, I told them, well, I'm a swimmer. And now all of a sudden I thought, I don't don't know what to say. So I just said, I used to swim. And the guy said, well, it's pretty clear you still know how to. (laughs) But at that point, there was this tension in, in, in me finding my identity in being a Christ follower. It wasn't about this, and, and swimming's a good thing. I recommend it, right? Like, I recommend that every adult and child learn how to swim. It's really healthy when you're at a lake hanging out in a boat and you fall out. You should know how to swim. It's a good thing. Swimming's a fine thing. It just isn't an ultimate thing. It isn't something where we should find our identity. Nothing other than Christ should fall into that category, We once walked in these things. There was a time when our life was defined by this. And even though now on the other side of it, occasionally there are moments when we wrestle and we struggle and we live in that tension of who am I? I'm not sure. There's still this reality that we are no longer defined by those things. We aren't that person. That isn't true of us. We are in Christ. We are the incarnation of truth. We are making spiritual realities, experiential realities in the present. That's what we do. We make truth come to life. That's why we're here. Paul continues on in these verses with this perfect illustration. Verse 8, he says, because of this, this is this transformation that's taken place in spiritually, spiritual reality. He says, but you must put them all away anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk from your mouth. And basically what he's saying is those of you that thought, you know, you were in the clear because you didn't have sexual issues or you didn't covet, he pretty much covers the rest of us in this list, right? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. And he says, don't don't lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul uses this illustration that we're going to look at much more clearly next week. It's really beautiful what he begins to unpack, and I'm excited for next week. But it's an illustration we can all identify with, and it's one of just getting dressed, the clothes that you wear. What he's saying is the clothes, they don't make the man. 
You are not what you're wearing. These behaviors that you're exhibiting, they don't define you. The clothes don't make the man, but sometimes the clothes don't make sense, do they? You're not defined by what you're wearing on the outside with these behaviors, but sometimes these behaviors, they don't make sense for the reality that's taken place inside of your soul. A couple weeks ago, I turned over a new leaf and I started dressing nicer during the week. People are really weird about it. Had somebody two weeks ago, they said, you look nicer during the week than you do on Sundays. And I said, well, it's because during the week I go to work and on Sunday I go to church. That didn't help. <laughs> they were like, that doesn't make any sense. You wear jeans on Sunday. And, you know, it was just like this weird conversation. And then this last week, one day I, I wore a tie underneath a sweater just because ties look good, right? Like, Every now and then, a guy that doesn't have to wear a tie likes to wear a tie. You know what everybody said? Do you have some sort of meeting? Like, <laughs> going to court? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, all day, you know? And it was funny, because all week long, I mean, every time I dressed a little bit nicer, just a little bit more attention given to what I, everybody, every day, somebody said, well, and then finally, like, the last day, I just kind of threw in the towel, and I was like, I'm just going to wear jeans and a shirt and whatever, and I showed up at the office, and I think it was Nick goes, that's better. Right? Because it just didn't make sense. Like, well, the way I looked didn't make sense with where I was, what I was doing. There was this sort of disconnect. The clothes don't make the man, but sometimes the clothes don't make sense. And Paul says this stuff, all this stuff that's broken and painful, all this stuff that, that looks like you stopped believing the gospel, he says all of these things that are disintegrating you, like worn out clothes, they don't make sense for you to keep on wearing this isn't behavior modification. This is, would you just be who you have been created to be? Put on the new you. Put on the new self, which is being, verse 10, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. There's a past tense reality that Paul has identified in us, and then there's a present tense reality that he unpacks in verse 10, which is being. And this phrase speaks to the process. You and I are in process. The gospel has released us, has freed us to be in process. But you and I are not the sum of our deeds. We are in process. We are being renewed. We are cultivating this new you. Something happened inside of you. Something was planted inside of you called the gospel. There's a new reality, and, and we're cultivating the gospel inside of us, and it creates a new you, the you who you really are. Once again, in, in these verses, Paul connects that transformation that's taking place to the mind. Remember in the verses right before this that we looked at last week, he, he spoke very specifically about seeking things above, about setting our minds on things above. There's a, a reality that our minds have a big part to play in the transformation, the cultivation of this new life in Christ. In Romans 12, he actually told us that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. There is a process that's taking place, and our minds are largely a part of that process. He's bringing us back to who we are. And our transformation is the byproduct of us being reminded of who the gospel says we are. See, re religion doesn't transform you. The rules, they do not transform you. Religion transforms us like dog training. I always love it when dog owners pride themselves in this one little activity where they take the dog and they get their treat and it smells like bacon, you know, so even we're mildly interested in eating it, right? <laughs> and they take it, you know, and they wave it past the dog and they say, stay. And they throw that treat and they say, stay. And the good dog owners, they like to stand back and start another conversation. Meanwhile, the dog's over here just like trembling, right? Just like, <laughs> just like shaking all over, right? Just like, 
I'm going to die here, right? And so that dog will sit there, and you've seen it. People, you've seen this done, right? The dog will just sit there, and they'll just talk, and they'll, talk, and they'll be going along, and all that dog owner has to say is, okay. And the dog just bolts for it, right? That's religion. Religion doesn't make us free, and it doesn't transform us. Behavior modification just leaves us staring at whatever it is we want and just shaking and hoping that we don't give in. And we just look and gaze and all we're waiting for is someone or something to give us permission to chase it. That's religion. That's not the gospel. Paul says, you are not that dog who's bound by that thing anymore. You can get up and walk away. Can you imagine a dog ever doing that? Eh. (laughs) It would wreck every duck hunter in the world, right? (laughs) No. But that's what makes us different. We are renewed. We have new life in Christ. See, growth doesn't happen by us working to earn something that we don't have. It happens by us working to live in the reality that we already have. That's what this is about. Who are you? Live in the reality of who you are and be set free. Be set free. Doesn't mean there's not a tension there. Doesn't mean that there aren't moments. I mean, that's a very real thing. Notice that Paul says, it's, it's an ongoing theme with him. There's an old self and a new self. And there are times that when you start to disbelieve the gospel, you will want to resolve that tension in you with the old self. That's when he says, don't do it. That's why we need continual immersion. That's why we need the transformation of the mind. That's why daily we're encouraged. That's why we spend time praying and reading the word. That's why gatherings like this are important. Uh, This may sound religious to some of you, but I want you to understand it's in the same heart as this. Do you know how many times I'm not surprised when there's somebody who was real consistent in being a part of a community of faith, and then all of a sudden they drift off and their life gets in ruins and they come back and they go, I don't know what happened. I know what happens every time. You stopped being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You stopped putting yourself in places where God could work and remind you of his gospel. It's why every week we preach the gospel at Summit. It's why we need to preach the gospel to ourselves continually, reminding ourselves, who am I? Who has Christ created me to be? We need community to do that. Nick this morning talked about community groups. Community groups, let me just say this, they aren't groups of friends that are hanging out together. We all have enough friends. Our community groups are about people living out gospel community together, which means they're reminding one another constantly, consistently, this is who Christ created you to believe, be, and I believe this about you. And we encourage one another towards the transformation that we began this thing for in the first place. Paul brings us back and he says, you're being renewed, you're being transformed. The gospel is shaping you. You're free to be in process as you make spiritual realities living realities. Amen? Let's pray together. Jesus, there's a part of me that wants to pray that you would somehow allow us to see ourselves every single moment of every single day, um, to somehow put a a, a lens on, a pair of glasses on, to allow us to see ourselves the way that you see us and that we would live the sort of redeemed, transformed life that, that, that you see us living. And yet the, the truth is, the reality is that when I look at your cross, every time I'm, I look at your cross, every time I look deep into the gospel, it's exactly what I see. I see who you believe me to be. I see who you believe us to be. I pray this morning that those of us that wrestle with taking off the worn out clothes of a past life would see those things for exactly as they are and that those places where we want to stop believing the gospel and run back to those old places of of trust, those old places of security, those old places of meaning, I pray that you would confront those in this moment and that you would allow us to turn and say, those things don't lead to life. And I no longer live that way. 
Give us the courage, Lord, to press deeply into the transformation of the gospel. I pray this in your name. Amen.